Y'all heard the summons. Praise ye the Lord. All ye servants of the Lord. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his deeds. And make him known among the people. Because our God is a mighty God. He's mighty in battle. Amen. What a privilege it is. And I hope one day we as the people of God realize how blessed we really are. You stand or you sit here right now and one thing that you haven't taken into account when you woke up this morning all your sins were gone. I know that didn't make sense to some of y'all, but your sins were under the blood. Isn't it wonderful that you have a God that has did all he needed to do to make sure that you are free from sin? Now, I can't do too much about you beating yourself up. You playing your little tapes, you know, you got it on that loop. You know how sometimes, uh, maybe y'all don't do this, but I do it sometimes. Sometimes there's a song I like and I can hear a certain thing. I just click this one little thing on my player and it's looped and it just keep playing and playing and playing. See, you can stop playing that loop now because you've been saved, you've been blessed. You've been anointed. <laughs> oh, life is going to happen. Didn't I tell y'all we get dirty? All of us get dirty? Yeah. But you have a God that came and subdued sin for that purpose. He said he came to condemn sin in the flesh. But he said don't obey it by the lust thereof. Because whomever you yield your members to obey, that's whom you serve. Amen. So if you obey God and be obedient from the heart, you're a servant of Christ. But if you obey the lust of the flesh, you're a servant of sin. So we certainly honor God this morning to all the blessed and redeemed people of the Lord. Amen. I'm so happy that I'm saved. Amen. I'm happy I'm forgiven. I'm happy that I'm set free. Amen. I can go ahead about my daily chores. And don't worry about it. See, the devil don't try to play stuff back to me no more. Because, see, all I do is just remind him, shut up, because you're going to hell like everybody else. And, and after a while, he stopped talking to me. He said, this brother right here, he must really know something. But, you know, Satan's just trying to take you where he's going. That's all. He's just a deceiver. I told you all that. But we honor God today. And we thank God for all you that are here. We honor our preachers on today. God bless you. To our praise worshipers, the Levites, to the mothers of God, to all the missionaries, to the men, if you're in your right place, the priest of God. Amen. You are the pastor of whatever your last name is, Church of God in Christ. Amen. Oh, yeah, God's going to work with you according to your leading. Yeah, he said, find me a man. Uh, now, he didn't say that women wouldn't use y'all. Don't go too fast now. I'm, I'm directing traffic. Stay with me. Amen. I'm just talking about the men now. Amen. The men have their proper place in the earth. And if they stand in the place where God has uh, 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 endowed them, they get privileges and powers that other people don't get. Amen. That's just Bible. That's all I could tell you. And I know favor is not fair, but it is favor. Amen. Now, if you get to crying and kicking the wall, you can't take favor away from folks that's favored. That's just the way it is. Amen. When folk is blessed, you can't curse them because you could ask Barak that. They, they paid money. 
And when he found out who he, they wanted him to curse, he said, I can't curse them folk. Them folks the children of God. Have you heard about their God? I ain't put the, no, take your money back. I ain't cursing them. So we're favored by God. Amen. We just have to understand it and walk in it. And without any further ado to the district missionary, God bless you. We praise God for you on the day. <laughs> Amen. So we thank God for all of you that are here. And I want to just rehearse a little bit about, uh, because I know today is Health Sunday, but I need to finish this and we can move forward. And, you know, there's another time to talk about diabetes and stuff like that. That's all wonderful, too. But you know what? I don't think we should have double whammies at the same time. In other words, it, something got to be optimized here. Now, listen, we might be in bad health, but we ought to have a good spiritual health or something. <laughs> you know, you know sometimes the devil's playing loops or something, but guess what? We ought to have a, a decent spiritual mind or something. Amen. We can't just let everything be out of balance. Amen. So today I want to just, just rehearse in your mind again about we need the mind of Christ. And the reason why this is so important I talked to you about the mind of Christ. Now, I just want to admonish or nudge or warn how not to have the opposite. Now, you got to think about this now. This is not real deep. You can't have your way. I know they say that about Burger King, but trust me, this is not a drive-up window. God did what he did so we can have the mind of Christ. Because if he, if he hadn't have done that, we would still be who we are. In other words, we wouldn't need anything. But God knew it was going to be important in this world that we have another mindset than our own mind. Now, how simplistic is that? I told y'all I'm going to beat a dead horse. Y'all know me. I'm good at that, right? So let's go back to the fourth grade Einstein. He knew in the fourth grade the absence of God. See, that's why I got to beat dead heart. Y'all done forgot. Einstein told his teacher, the absence of God, you can't have it your way. In other words, when you take God out the equation, there's nothing left but evil. See, you can't, you can't sit in the middle and say, I'm just going to wait until I get a certain age or wait till certain things happen, and then I'll pick God up later. No, because all the time God's not relevant in your mind, you're relevant in evil. Because you can't function in the middle. The Bible tells you that. God said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. If you're in the middle, I'm spitting you out. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I wish somebody had read their Bibles before they came this morning. It's in your book. Amen. So the reason why it's important to have the mind of Christ is because that mind in itself supplies favor and things that the normal person walking around will never achieve. I know that was a mouthful, but trust me. God doesn't bless everybody like he blessed people that walk with him. <clears throat> people that decide to really sacrifice their time, talent, and treasure to God and have a mind to want to be better, God does them different than he does everybody else. If you think I'm telling the story, why don't we hardly have too many more Pauls? Hmm? Paul was a different brother. Why don't we have more people like James and John, because they were people who wanted what Jesus said. When Jesus told them, said, if you just follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They turned the world upside down. They went from fishing to fishing. Amen? Because it was a mindset. Now, understand when I talked to you the other day, and I said to you, the reason why the mind of Christ is so important is because when you have the mind of Christ, you and God are one. Y'all remember the scripture? Who could tell me what scripture that was? Who, who, who took any notes? 
Did anybody take any notes? Yes. Who could tell me what that was? It's not a trick question. Who could tell me what it was? What did it say? So when you when you have when you have the mindset to want to do what Christ wants you to do to allow his mind to be in you, you and God becomes one. So when you and God becomes one, it doesn't stop trials and problems. What it does is gives you the power and ability to whatever's dead, you can resurrect it and make it come to life and work for you. See, a lot of people didn't believe that one because they're stuck thinking, well, you know the reason why, you know, I might as well go on back to drinking because look what done happened. Uh-uh. No. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm going to keep the mind of Christ because I'm going to need God. Right? And, and, and the time that I need him most is going to be the time that probably going to be an inopportune time that I wish I'd, I would have had him. Right? And then you don't have to beat yourself up about stuff because you understand the plan. The plan is the mind of Christ stops you from being on the opposite side. Okay? So now, when you look at comp compare and contrast, there's really only one other mind to compare Christ to. Because we're not equal to have the mind of Christ. Because he said, who are we that we might instruct him? We can't even instruct. We can't even go to God and try to barter stuff. Because we don't know enough about him. But Satan was with him from the beginning. And since Satan was with him from the beginning, he is already a defeated foe because he knows the end result. He just won't share it with you. What he does is he uses his tactics to keep you from having the mind of Christ because once you really understand how much power you have, you become victorious. It's the same scenario with the elephant. Those people that have the elephants at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the circus, the elephant's just been deceived. Do you know the elephant can pull up an iron spike and break a chain just by doing that? But you know what they do? They make him believe he's walking around in circles and chained down and can't do nothing. Go to the circus. The elephant, if he wants to, with one tug, or take that whip and choke the man to death with it. He's got that kind of power. But he's been induced to believe he's nothing. And that's what happens when you don't allow the mind of Christ to, 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 to work and flow in you and quit playing the tapes and try to make yourself be less than what God said. God says you are because he is. To them that believe, to them he gives them the power to be the sons and daughters of God. You can't even be the son and daughter of God till you first believe what he said. Look at this. The contrast with Christ's attitude with that of Lucifer. See, he wasn't Satan. He was Lucifer first. Now, here's what I want y'all to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this down. I want you to get Isaiah, the 14th chapter, and read verses 12 through 15. You don't have to read it right now. As a matter of fact, if you want to go down to 16, 17, 18, it's good history. But you're going to see in Isaiah, how many of y'all remember people talked about Isaiah being the eagle eye prophet? Yes. In other words, Isaiah was the one who could see down the line of time and told you stuff that was going to happen before it happened. This is Isaiah telling you what's going to happen to Satan before it happens. He's already telling you. So you have no need to allow Satan to buffet you about when he is the one that's going to be rejected and sent to hell. You don't have to go. The only reason why you're going is because you don't believe the report. Now, now listen, I ask y'all not to read it now. 
So don't read it now. It's not going to help you now. I'm talking. So you got to read it later. See, one thing we have to learn to do with the mind of Christ is learn to be obedient. Because, see, Christ, is never, Christ was never contrary to what his father asked him. See, and that's the one thing we have to learn to do as human beings. There's always a structure above you. There's always something to keep you in line. Just think if there were no speed limits and lights. You think you mad at the traffic. <laughs> uh, you haven't even started getting upset yet. Tell folks run into your car on purpose. I don't know what you're talking about. Ain't nothing going to happen. I drive the way I want to drive. You know you be, come on somebody. Save will be out the window right then. So there's always something that God has used to keep us. Even if you look at Genesis, Genesis 3, 1 through 7, you could look at it a little later, but even Adam was tricked by Satan. See, what you have to understand in Lucifer was one of the most beautiful, created, angelic beings ever. Ever. And I'm going to show how delicate this is now. God created him on purpose just to sing praises. That's right. That's right. That was his job. That's right. He didn't know nothing else because he was created. He, did, he, did, he wasn't born. He didn't have no mother and father. And he was so beautiful, so wonderful, so angelic to hear and look at in the midst of the most holiest place you can be. He got corrupted. See, this is why it's so important for you to stay with the mind of Christ because it doesn't matter how much Holy Ghost and power God give you, you can corrupt yourself by allowing your mind to drift into other things you know God don't have nothing to do with. Just think about it. Even the theologians now are arguing about the fact that Satan or Lucifer at the time was one of the highest angelic beings and he was close to the throne of God. And when you get a chance, read Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. When you go home today, I want you to read that. Ezekiel 28, 11 and 19. See, we don't know enough about the devil because we don't study we don't run reference on him. You know, why don't you Google like you Google other folks? <laughs> Google Satan and just look at the stuff he done and where he came from. He's a defeated foe right now. But we don't believe it. He knows it. What God, what God Satan corrupted was and I want to just say this to these young ladies and to these young brothers. You think you handsome? Ain't nothing wrong with that. But don't know you are. Sisters, you think you're beautiful? Ain't nothing wrong with that. But don't you find out you are. Because when Satan found out he was beautiful and found out, found out he was wonderful and needed, he got corrupted. He got corrupted. Because you know what he did? He did not want to sing praises no more. He wanted to be like God. See, it's something about when you lose the mind of Christ, you get this arrogance about you that you want to gravitate to stuff you can't control. How could Satan want to be God when God created him? How can you tell God about his plan when he the one pulled you in it? Now, all of a sudden, you're going to tell God what holiness is about. How? When God is the one bequeathed to you eternal life. Tell me where you go to get it. Tell me where you go to get faith. Tell me where you go to knock on the door and fill out papers to get favor. Tell me where you go to get the blessings you need for tomorrow. See what I'm trying to show you? See, when you don't have the mind of Christ, you run a chance 
of getting arrogant and falling into the same depravity that Lucifer was in. And these are some of the things that you have to be wondering about. He didn't just want, you know, to be God. He, he, you know, he was tired of being created. He wanted to be the creator. You know, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you the sunshine of your own life. No, you're not. No. That's what I'm saying. It's okay to be. But don't you find out you are. Amen. Because sometimes when we find out we're a little bit further than what we think we are, it's something about our nature that corrupts us. Because if you notice, Satan went and his whole ploy was not to be humble like Jesus. He didn't want that. See, he'd have been humble as long as he stayed the praiser. As long as he stayed the head of the choir. But then now he gets into this spirit, I will. I will be like God. I will set my throne above the heavens. I will ascend to the highest points of the heavens. And I'll set, I will sit on top of everything. When is the last time you've been submissive enough and told God, Lord, what is your will for me? Lord, have your way in me. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. I'm just trying to show you a little bit here today because when you're always in the posture of everything's got to be the way you want it to be, you may have to check that out. I mean, just, 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 just do a survey. You don't have to answer the question out loud, but when is the last time you asked God, God, what's your will for me? Have your way in me. God, God, let your will be done. I know you, now listen, I know you got stuff planned. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But when the last time you asked God to let his will be done in you? See, how can you serve and magnify God that you won't even give him a chance to tell you what he want? At least before Satan got corrupted, God gave him the layout of the land. I want you to stand here and look good and just sing these, these songs and I want it to just ring through heaven. At least he knew that until he got corrupted. So what am I saying to you? So what I'm saying to you is, it doesn't matter because God has sent Jesus to die for you. It doesn't matter because you have eternal life. It doesn't matter because you have the Holy Ghost in you. If you don't keep things in the right flow and the right check, you can get corrupted. Because we have sin nature in us. The easiest thing to revert back to is what you used to be. It only takes a few seconds. Let something happen you really not expecting. First thing we're going to blame is, see, see, if I'd only been praying more, if I'd only been, you already knew that before it happened. Right? Why do you know we're supposed to pray without fainting? Well, it ain't cause, it's not because of that happened, right? God does things to keep us honest and to show us when we start. Listen, I'm glad God shows me when it's easier for me to slide off the cliff than what I'm doing now. Wouldn't you rather know? I would. I would rather know if I'm short than to know it later. I'd rather know right now I don't have enough love in my heart than to find out later. So God does these things to us because it's called a process. And when you're in the process, you have to develop and learn and grow. And you can't learn and grow until you get to a place where you don't know what you're doing. See, as long as you know what you're doing and got everything in control, you're you going to you know, grow the way you want to grow, right? 
It don't work that way with God. Look at this. Look at this. Lucifer was not satisfied. He wasn't satisfied to be a rebel himself. That's why he invaded a garden and tempted man to be a rebel. I mean, if you read the story about Satan or the snake, the Bible said it was the most subtle beast of the field. Now, what kind of animal was this that was so subtle and so tricky, right, that God had to curse it and put it on its belly? See, the snake wasn't a snake until God put the curse on him. So what I'm trying to show you is Satan, you can't even understand how he even began to look because he's so subtle, you don't even know his tactics and they can be engrafted so easily. Satan's tactics are so subtle because he tells the truth, but it's just twisted. The woman said, well, you know, God told us we can't eat this. Satan said, oh, that ain't really what he said. He just don't want you to be, he don't want you to be like him. See, see, the whole thing is, Satan knew that the fruit was going to do what it did. But he was so subtle, he didn't try to stop him. He just said, oh, no, he just, you know, the reason why you can't eat it is. See, he told the truth. You can't eat it. But the only reason is because you are going to be like God. Your eyes are going to be open. Now, I want you to understand how powerful that is. Had Adam not done that, we would never have to die. That's right. Everything we had would have been eternal. Everything that happened to us wouldn't have never decayed. We would have never had to work. Women would never have to conceive in sorrow. It would have been a joyful thing. You never would have been afraid of snakes. Come on, y'all. Can't you see what one little subtle act can destroy? Can't you see that when God sets you up to bless you and your family for generations, all it takes is just one subtlety and it'll change the whole course of your family. And it's not because you don't know. It's just that you won't let the mind of Christ rest on you because he tells you when you have the mind of Christ, you're not ignorant of Satan's devices. See, the normal mind can't deal with it, but when you have the mind of Christ, he can't subtly come in and trick you. That's why it's so important. And just think about it. Adam had all that he needed. According to what God told him, Adam was really a king of God's creation. Brothers, I ain't talking about Africa. I'm talking about since the beginning of the time, we've always been kings. See, see a lot of folks won't clap on that because they don't believe that. But when he made man, why did he say in Genesis 1 and 26, and he gave him dominion over all his creation? <laughs> I don't understand what you don't understand about dominion. The only person that has dominion over everything is somebody who's totally in charge. So why would he need Satan to help him be what he already was? See, 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 this is what happens when we're not clear on the mind of Christ. We I don't even know what word to use that, that won't sound really indignant about it because we throw away 
are our blessings and inheritance over foolishness. We have dominion. We have power. But we let Satan trick us because our minds are not succinct with what God has orchestrated our minds to be. See, one thing you can understand about the human mind and understand about Christ. Christ was humble. Just check yourself. Christ came to do the will of God. Check yourself. You can track and tell where you are. Now, I'm going to tell you now, it's difficult. Because while you're in your flesh, if your flesh is not under subjection, you're not going to be humble. You're not going to be submissive. Matter of fact, if you wasn't really afraid of some things, you just wouldn't do nothing nobody tell you. <laughs> oh, you know I got it, right? Some of us, if we wasn't afraid of jail time, we wouldn't stand up when the judge walk in the chamber. I don't respect no man. No, you're going to get up from there if he walk in. <laughs> Let him have a black coat on, a black robe on. And he come in. Y'all know my experience of, 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 of when I was 20-something of, of the judge. I told y'all about this before, right? Y'all don't know? Oh, I learned real quick. I'm in the court and forgot I had a hat on. I stood up, sat back down. He said before he started, young man. Do you know where you are? I said, yes, sir. He said, then act like it. Take that hat off. Man, who you talk? I don't like the way you, you coming at me. Both are done like that. Oh, y'all don't want to play with me now. Y'all going to act like I'm crazy, huh? What would have happened to me? I could have told him, man, I'm from the west side. Who you think you're talking to? I'll flex too. How much time would I have gotten? See, what I'm trying to show you is when you really could understand fundamentals, you can get along a lot better. That's all. The red light is not making you waste no gas, it ain't time for you to go. I'm just saying, there are a lot of things in our lives we just don't pay attention to and we don't understand how that filters and feeds into our spirits. That's why folks got road rage. What in the world you want to shoot somebody for? Because they changed the lane. Wait, 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 wait. You mean to tell me this whole lane is yours? And if I got to turn right, I can't get in the lane and turn right? No, I know I can't do it in front of you and make you go, eh, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about you just going to shoot me because I'm in the, another lane. Y'all know that don't make sense. But can't you see what I'm trying to show you? As saints of God, if we're going to have the mind of Christ, our whole M.O. has to be different. We, we can't just be like, listen, it, why do you think God allowed us to see all the things about Satan and all the things about Jesus? He tells you, choose, choose. I'm going to set both good and evil before you, but I want you to choose. And he winks at you better choose good. And we still won't choose good. Satan said, you shall be like God. <sighs> you already got dominion. Why do you want to be like God? Why is it about us brothers? We always grasp uh, at stuff we can't control. Okay, I just heard somebody say sisters too. Why do we? Why do we always try to gravitate towards stuff that we don't have no control and no prowess in, meaning no intelligence? How, how, how in the world Satan's going to be 
God. He don't know nothing about being God because he was created. <laughs> How do we know about all this stuff and somebody just barely gave us something? I want y'all to just think about that. But think about that for a moment. We all, the Bible said, do not exercise yourself in matters too high for you. There are some things in this world too high for us. We shouldn't even be involved in it. Let me ask y'all a question. If God gave you an opportunity to make it to heaven on 30 percentile of what you're available to do, would you be happy? I would. I would. Because the Bible says some 30, some 60, and some 100. Why would you try to be on the 100 percentile level when he made a way for you to go to heaven on 30 percent? You know, it, it's, it's like, you know it's, like, it's like the gift assessments. What's your gift? You fill out the paper, you answer the questions, and don't nobody know what you said but you. And then you get the graph, and the graph says, you a good hospitality worker. Ah, oh, that thing's wrong, child. I know I'm a prophet. They told me years ago, Sister Susu saw me in the spirit and said I was going to be a prophet. But according to everything you said, says you're a good hospitality worker. So why would you waste your time trying to be a prophet when you, go, you can make it to heaven just helping folk come in and out? What kind of sense does that make? But that's the subtlety of Satan. Satan told Adam after having dominion. Oh, you just, you know, you just, he just don't want you. Wait, 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 didn't he just tell me I had dominion? What do you mean he don't want me? See, sometimes when our wires get crossed, we can't see the obvious. <laughs> we can't see the obvious. We gravitate toward things that we always have dreamed of being when that's not what God wanted us to be. And as that result, Satan plunged, Adam plunged humanity into sin and death. And we have not recovered. We haven't recovered. Death is more prevalent now than it ever has been. Yes, sir. You can't even, listen y'all, we can't even turn on the television. Every morning, I've been checking this out for the last week. Every morning, when I turn the television on at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm watching breaking news, and this is some kind of shooting. Now, now I admit, I don't know what a 14-year-old need to be out at 4 o'clock in the morning for. I admit that. I admit that. I could see that. I could see somebody at 3, 4 in the morning doing unsavory things because, you know, monsters come out at night. Stars don't come out at night. Monsters come out at night. And the later the night is, the more monsters roam the street. You don't have to say amen to me. I know. Because, listen, if it was like that in the 70s and 80s when I was out there, I, I don't even know what's happening in 2023. Some of them monsters out there now, probably just me looking at them, would make me go home. But it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just the minds of the people are not succinct in what God, God wants us to love one another, to help one another. That's the mind of Christ. If Christ left all the glory in heaven to come help me, you mean to tell me I don't have nothing else better to do than to cause problems? No. No. Now, now we expect, we expect people who are not Christians to have a selfish, arrogant spirit. We expect that. 
But the news flash today is saints or people who call by God should not be mirroring the people of the world. Amen. Philippians 2 and 1 says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Question. Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. That's Philippians 2 and 1 in the New Living Translation. Is there any consolation? you have any hope in God? Can you see any benefits of being part of God? Can you see any love? Can you see any hope? Is there any, any consolation? Is there any peace? Anything? If there is, he said, help me to rejoice. <laughs> Paul was telling the Philippians, he hoped that somebody was getting it because he didn't want to preach all these years and they didn't understand nothing he was saying. Right. He told them, refresh my bowels. In other words, make me happy. Make me happy. If you learned anything. There are more than 20 times in the New Testament God instructs us how to live. He tells us point blank what to do. And you know it's difficult to have the mind of Christ when you can't even put forth an effort to let it be in you. All right. All right. See when the Bible says let this mind be in you what he's saying is, I'm going to show you how the mind works. Now, don't do nothing to make it not work. See, if I give you something and say, let that sit right there, that don't mean go touch it and look at it. Come on, somebody. If I say I'm going to give you $100, put this in your bank account, and let it stay there till I come back next week, what business do you have spinning it? See, what that says is you don't even respect what somebody's giving you to let it do what it's supposed to do. You're going to change it because you're arrogant. When the Bible says, let this mind be in you, God not going to let, he's not going to hope a mind be in you and not tell you how the mind's supposed to work. All right. All right. <laughs> but your job is to let it be in you. Yeah. Don't do nothing to stop it. Don't destroy it. Don't deter it. I don't want you to add nothing to it. Because if I did, I'll tell you, I want you to add $50 to that hundred I'll give you. And when you come, when I come back, I'll give you some more. But don't try, don't mess with it. That's just something we can't do. So I'm going to give you five points that'll help you get the mind of Christ if you want it. See, by this time, you should be getting your pencils out, your notes, your paper. Getting your little iPad ready. Get the little imaginary clipboard. Get it. Get ready to write. That's if you want to, because I don't think you're going to remember all this. We need the mind of Christ. And if we need it, then we have to learn what it looks like and learn how to allow it to operate. See, his mind's never going to take over your mind as long as your mind's in charge. Let me say that again. His mind is never going to take over your mind as long as your mind is in charge. That's why it's impossible for God to have his way in you and you won't invite him to have his way. You're not even praying, God, let your will be my will. Lord, this is my will this week. This is what I want. Well, what kind of mind is that? You're talking to God. You're not talking to the pastor. You're not talking to your brother. You're talking to God. <clears throat> and everything he gives us is instructing us how to live with one another. Think about that. 
Everything he does is teaching us how to live with one another. Why? God wants us to be spiritually healthy and be like Christ. He said, above all, I want you to be in good health and prosper, even as your soul prospers. See, health, a healthy mind is important. A healthy soul is paramount. Your body may not be in optimum health, but at least have a, a healthy mind and a healthy soul. Have some kind of optimization about you. Number one, we are to prefer one another. That's probably going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. And how do you prefer one another? I'll give you the scripture. Romans 12 and 10. Write that down. <laughs> We're so competitive, nobody's ever going to be better than us. Nobody's ever going to be first but us. You know, we used to get a whooping when I was little. If company came over, let them eat first. My mother better not catch me. <laughs> At the stove and folks sitting up waiting behind me. Oh, it was over. Oh, it was over. See, she was trying to teach us then how to prefer other folks than you. And that's something that's hard to do. Because you know what? We want to be number one. I don't care where we are. Let the guests eat first. The worst thing you can tell the church. See, see, some of y'all don't understand because you ain't worked in the kitchen. See? You're not saying, you, I don't think you, your Holy Ghost is tested until you work in the kitchen with folk go to church. <laughs> Hospitality could tell you, listen, let our guests go first. And then they embarrass because everybody that belongs to the church jump up and get in line first. So I'm telling you now, preferring one another is going to be probably the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Because the way we are socialized, we are not going to prefer somebody else before us. Oh, shoot, they should have gotten in line. I got mine. I don't think it's enough up there for everybody, but I, I'm getting mine. Come on, somebody. I know I'm in the right house. I'm in the right house. All I got to do is say we have an outing next week, and I invite seven folks. I guarantee you they're going to be at the last part of the line. But it shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't be that way. Edify one another. Not only do you prefer one another, but you edify one another. First Thessalonians 5 and 11. Edify. That kind of really means, you know, like, Speak nice, encouraging things of somebody else. I don't know if I should blame this on the sisters or the brothers. <laughs> but you, but you know, you know, sometimes these sisters just not gonna compliment nobody, right? It's just, it, you know, it's just, it's just, see, see, and that shows you how far we have to go because some of these things we got to consciously do. And some, some of these things, uh, I might say all of it, but some of these things I'm talking about, it's just not part of our, it's just not part of our psyche. Yeah. We just don't operate that way. We've been socialized to be stingy, selfish, and arrogant. And then we come to church and parade around like folk ought to be glad we showed up. Instead of being glad they there to say, God, I thank you. I bless your name. God, you're so wonderful. It's just the way we are. Number three. 
Bear each other's burdens. Galatians 6 and 2. That's difficult, too, because when the last time you put somebody else's problems above yours? Because you had an opportunity to help somebody. That's difficult now. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Listen, these things not going to just float down and happen. You got to consciously work on these things. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's always good about somebody. Somebody should have had the sense to help them. Well, you sitting there. What you going to do? You know, one of the greatest stories I heard about uh, uh, a leader was when Bishop King told a story about him out in uh, Peoria. In the heat of the day, he had stopped and got him a milkshake and was resting under a tree. And he saw this man struggling to walk. He was sweating and needed some water. And Bishop King said he sat there and he said, somebody ought to help that man. He said, God spoke to him and said, you help him. Now, this is a bishop. See what I'm trying to show you? He said he got up and helped the man. But that's how we do some. We see people with burdens and struggling, and we may have the opportunity to help, and we put it off on somebody else. Bear one another's burden. And here's something that's really hard. I'm sorry, but it's, it's, just, it's, it's just difficult. We shouldn't judge one another. Now, I'm not, ta I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about this little fake stuff, these folk talking. Let me tell you how that sounds. When something happens and they know somebody's wrong and you can correct them and help them be right, I ain't, I, ain't, I, I ain't judging. Saints judge the world. But we don't judge one another. Trying to make somebody less than you because you think you're here and they're there. Could I tell y'all something? I preach, sometimes I'm not well. My back hurts. Sometimes this hurts, sometimes that hurts. Sometimes I sweat out my clothes, y'all sit there. Sometimes I barely get an amen. But when we all go to heaven, we're gonna get the same thing and you ain't done nothing. You don't, you don't see me putting the difference between you and me and I'm doing all the work. But we got some folks that'll let you know where they stand and where you stand. That's right. When we go to heaven, we all gonna get the same thing. Ain't no need me talking down, down to you because I think I'm gonna be sitting next to Jesus. That ain't gonna happen. The Bible said the righteous is scarcely gonna make it in. Because judgment begins at the church. Where will the sinner and godly appear if those who are doing the best they can scarcely make it in? Now that's what the Bible says. Where them other folks that are doing what they want to and don't obey nobody, where are they going to end up? That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Uh shouldn't judge one another, Romans 14 and 13. But we should admonish one another. Somebody tell me what it means to admonish somebody. That's Romans 15 and 14. What does it mean to admonish somebody? Romans 15 and 14. What does it mean to admonish? Love them where they are. Is that it? Y'all satisfied with that? S speak up, Sister Maya. Admonish one another. Y 
Y'all might have not heard what I said. Admonish one another. Who y'all got Google? Just type in admonish. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So when the preacher's trying to admonish you and tell you things, you shouldn't get an attitude. If somebody else telling your brother, I, I heard you belong to Rehoboth. I, don't, I didn't think the folks at Rehoboth act like that. Ain't no need getting mad at them. They seeing something that they know you know better. Right? Sister, I know the mothers at Rehoboth live holy. You know what? So nobody else will know. Why don't you just leave? You can't tell me what to do. I'm grown. See, can I tell you what the Bible says about, not what Solomon said, but what the Bible says about people who can't be instructed? The Bible says that those who have the right spirit can be instructed, but those who are disobedient and arrogant are sensual and devilish. That's what the book says. So that shows you Satan is the only one you can't tell him what's right. <laughs> so you can't have the mind of Christ and you can't be flexible enough to learn and to grow because the Bible says if you delight yourself in me, right. I'll give you the desires of your heart. Most people think that means to be happy. But in the Greek, the word delight means to be flexible. So that means if you can come to church and grow and learn and learn that you need to be flexible because today you think you're right, but I'm showing you you're not. If you can be flexible and I can help you, I'll give you whatever you desire. And this is why a lot of people miss the things of God because they're not flexible. They're stuck in their ways and they don't want nobody telling them nothing. Especially people who are over them. Now if we do it to a stop sign, Stop saying talking to you. What you you ain't got no business. Be, this ain't California. You know, California have that, that rolling stop. They play like they stop and all the time their car's still moving. It's just going a little slower. And they're gonna go right on through the stop sign. Stop sign says stop. We won't even obey the stop sign. And you know what we do, Sister Vanessa? This is funny, and I'm almost done. You know what we do? When we get ready to go get our driver's license tested, we nervous as a mouse at a cat's conference. We walking around scared because the whole week, Sister Yolanda, we want to make sure every one of them signs, we're going to remember what the ones look like without the word because we want to pass the test. That rectangle means stop. The one with these many, we count the little thing. If I see that, that means yield. If I see this one, this one, and it don't say nothing, but we're going to try to memorize it. And then when we get our license and we see the same sign, we don't even listen to it. You know that don't make sense. But that's how we do. So now I have a question for you, and I'm done. Out of the five things I gave you, what is the basic word in all those things? Thank you. 
one another. Sister Jennifer said it. One, it's, it's dealing with one another. When you, when you have the mind of Christ, you can't struggle dealing with one another. Because God's in each and every one of us. Somebody's going to need some help, y'all. And we got to bond together and help. Somebody going to be wrong, y'all. And we're going to have to have enough love to let them know they're wrong. Somebody is going to have a lifestyle that you can't beat them up for because they just don't know no better. It ain't no need to judge them. They're going to come along. They may get it a little later. You just happen to be on the train now. But only God knows where you've been. Everything is about dealing with one another. If there's anything you learned today, you learned that in order for you to have the mind of Christ, you cannot be selfish. You can't be selfish and you can't be arrogant. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to have some some love, especially, but you got to have some empathy. Your, your, your heart has got to go out for something now. Yeah. For somebody. Amen. One of the greatest, probably I think, maybe, maybe not. One of the greatest challenges I've had this year was having to put things above the church to make sure somebody else was okay. That's not easy to do. Because you got the folks mad at you because they think they ought to have a church. And then you got folks that's barely making it and they need help. What you going to do? Well, what we going to do? Resurrect a, a monument and brag about it and then somebody's sitting over here dying. What, 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 what good is that? You understand what I'm trying to say? When you work on these things, it's going to be tough, y'all. I'm not, listen, I'm not painting y'all no rose garden. But when you deal on, in these five fundamentals, it's going to take some real sincere dedication. Because you know what? God is going to test you. And you want to know what kind of mind you got before you meet him. Even, even if you have to get somebody else to help you, help somebody. Don't see somebody going down and don't do nothing. <laughs> you got to do something? Yes. Because just think, he did something for us. We were going down, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard your despairing cry. And out of the waters, he lifted you. How did he get you out? Love lifted me. Could nothing help but love. Y'all, we got to get back to love. We got to love one another. The cavalry ain't coming. We the cavalry. Amen. So we have to love one another. I want to thank you all for coming today, hearing the second part. We don't want to have the mind of Lucifer. We don't want to be bamboozled and tricked. Amen. We want to know his. He just, just remember this. Whatever Satan tell you, it's a lie. You don't never got to repeat it. You don't never have to ask nobody else if it's true. Just when it comes from him, you know it's a lie. Understand this. Satan not going to never tell you to do nothing good. He ain't going to tell you to do nothing good. He's going to always lie to you and make you do the opposite. Amen. When you understand that, you're on your way. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's bless the name of the Lord. He's a strong tower.